Good evening. Uh, this lecture, Bezrat Hashem, will be Leiluin uh, Nishmat Shulamit Bat Yafa and Zarara Sara Bat Dona Azulai, also Leiluin Nishmat Ruven Ben Suza Nochayon, also Lechazara Bet Shuva of Batia Bat Nirit. And also for Zarin Bad Zivande, Leiluin Nishama. Also for Shimon Brink, Ben Avraham, for success and health and Tikkun Gam. Top, Baruch Hashem, before we speak about our. Uh, weekly topic, the parasha. Today, the Israeli court in Israel ruled in the tragic case two or three months ago, if you remember, an Israeli family went to Italy. And while they were actually on the air train, the cables ripped and the air train fell, and 14 out of the 15 people that were on this air, tra air train, they died. It was the parents of this boy, Ethan, the parents, some other relatives, I think four or five Jews were there in a trip, Israelis, they died. This guy, this kid, Ethan, his parents are two Israelis who moved to Italy. So the boy is the only survivor from this family. He left alone in the world. He has grandparents in Israel and an aunt that lives in Italy. So now the question is, who is going to get the kid to raise him? Baruch Hashem, Today, when something like this happens, not always family members are interested to raise an orphan kid. It's very, very difficult to raise someone that is not your child. It's very difficult to raise your own kids, not to talk about to raise someone else's kid. Because usually those teenagers, they rebel very much about their step-parents. For instance, if a woman got divorced and she had teenager kids, boys or girls, and she got remarried, Nine out of ten times, the kids will go into a World War III with a stepfather. They don't accept him. They want their own father, all kinds of things. And the father from the other side is jealous. So he will instigate between them and the stepfather. And they, as it is, don't like the new situation. They're miserable. Usually it ends very bad. So usually... If you ask a man that go, going to get married to a woman, do you want her with her kids? Or you prefer that the kids will go with the father and it's just going to be you and her? Of course it's going to say just me and her. I don't want a headache of raising other kids. Even though when we're talking about an orphan, if you raise an orphan in your house, it counts like you gave birth to him. You can get a huge reward for it. But today is very difficult, very difficult, because I can see everywhere I go the same problems people have. That's, that's one of the main reasons why a lot of people did not get remarried, like women that, ha that were stuck with kids, and they had an opportunity to get married, and they saw that it's not working, you know, between her kids and her future husband, and they just gave up on their love. Over here, we have a different situation. Both families are fighting to raise this kid. Very interesting. For secular people to fight to raise someone else's child, it's a, to me it's a big surprise. To dedicate thousands of hours to raise someone else's kid. So we have two families are fighting who's going to raise the kid. It's very much like the trial of King Solomon. Two women fight for the same baby. Remember this famous trial? So the end from Italy and the grandfather from Israel. In the meantime, after the tragedy, the Israeli grandfather flew to Italy, and he was with a kid. 
somehow he took him with a train to Switzerland, crossed the border, and escaped to Israel. In international law, it's considered kidnapping. Even if a parent does it, it's kidnapping. If two parents get divorced and one takes the kid with him to a different country, even a different state, that could be kidnapping. Because you need both parents to agree that the kids should move from where they grew up or where they live in the time of the divorce to a long distance place. You need both sides to sign on it. So what happened now? The aunt in Italy is not giving up. She came to Israel and sued this grandfather in Israeli court. And the judge is a woman, secular woman. The last thing she cares about is what the Torah say. And today they gave the ruling. The question is now, according to the Torah, where is this kid should grow? By his grandparents or by his aunt? We have two sides to the story. One, he grew up in Italy since he's a baby. He was, he, he, his parents went to Italy when he was a few months old. So he basically speak Italian. He grew up with the kids in Italy. Or he should be in Israel. The grandparents say our kids were supposed to move to Israel anyway. They were talking about it. They just didn't get to do it. They died before they did it. Anyway, they would move to Israel. Then what the aunt would do? What did she have to do with the kid? We are the grandparents. We will raise this kid. The aunt said, no. The kid grew up in Italy. I should raise him. I should adopt him. It's my sister, this, that, that. Complicated story. What did the judge rule? Who knows? What would you rule? To send him back to Italy or to keep him by the grandparents in Israel? So when you deal with secular judges, they have to follow the law of people. People made the laws. People make laws and they have a lot of defects in those laws. But the judge has to rule based on the constitution and the, and the, and the law of the state. The logic of the judge was, since the father took the kid without permission, we have to go against him. Meaning, maybe if he will arrange to take the kid with permission, maybe they rule a different ruling. But she ruled that the kid has to go back to Italy. And no matter what claim, and also that the, fa the grandfather has to pay all the expenses of the trial, which is how much? 70,000 shekel, $22,000 for the lawyers of both sides. In Israel, when you sue someone, if you lose, most likely you're going to have to pay for their lawyers, not just for yours. It's not like here. Anyone can sue you for nothing, and just the lawyer is going to cost you $20,000, and they know it. So they know you will reach a settlement with them for 5000 because if you don't, you have to pay 20 to your lawyer. So even if you're 100% right and you're completely not guilty, you rather pay 5,000 to the crook than to hire a lawyer, pay him 20,000 to save the 5,000. Very stupid law. But in Israel, you have a lot to lose. You sue someone, you, may, you better make sure that you really believe in your case. That's not just a blackmail attempt. Because if you lose, you're going to pay for your lawyer and his lawyer. That's avoid 80% of the, of the lawsuits. A lot of people say, I don't want to sue. Why? I may lose. Oh, you may lose. Why you want to sue? Wasting the court's time. So a lot of people give up. Talk. Let's see, according to the Torah, what's the right order of inheritance? How do you inherit? So, according to the Torah, When a person dies and he did not leave a will, he did not make a will. When a person make a will before he dies, he has to know exactly what to write in a will. If you make a mistake in one word, 
it cancel and void the will. Then the court, the, the, the religious court, will do something completely different than what you wrote in a will. For instance, if you write in a will, I would like to inherit all my money to my daughters. If you write this language, lehorish, lebnotai et kol rechushi, the bedding cannot give them a penny from it. Why? Because the Torah said that girls do not inherit their, their parents, only the boys. Why the girls do not inherit? Because they get married in a very young age, at least back then, that's how it was, 12, 13. Before they start their life, they're already married, and the husband's going to take care of them financially. They don't need. The woman in the old days, she didn't have to go work, or have a career, or go to college. All women were in all, at home. They didn't go to school. From young age, they, did, they took care of the animals, of the roosters, the chickens, the cows, uh, do laundry, sew, you know, things like that. So that's the way the world was. So if a father died, only the boys inherit. But as long as the girls live still in the house, let's say she's six, seven, eight years old, they must feed her with the same condition she had until now, until she gets married. So if she doesn't get married, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, doesn't matter. As long as she's in the house, they must take care of all her needs. So the Torah says that a, a girl cannot inherit her parents. So if the father writes, I want my daughter to inherit my state, that means you're contradicting the Torah. The Torah says a girl cannot inherit. And you wrote the language, Lorish, Yerusha. It's against the law of the Torah. You cannot make conditions that contradict the law of the Torah. So how are you going to give it to your girls? Let's see your girls are religious, nice girls, and your boys are bums. You know, drug addicts, criminals. You don't want to give them a penny. They don't deserve a penny. But you have good girls, nice, modest, decent. You want your girls to have, uh, you know, money to do good things with that. Who are you going to give it to these criminals? So you have to know how to write it. You have to write in a will that you are giving every, what everyone to give to your daughters as a gift. You have to use the language matana, not Yerusha. So one word, one word, the way you phrase it in a, in a will, can change the entire reality after that. If you say Yerusha, they cannot get a penny. This will is dismissed, not kosher will. If you say Matana, while I'm still alive, I write that this and this and that will go as a gift to my daughters, they must take it and give it to them, even if the boy screams, no, it's not fair, but why they get it? Doesn't matter, the father or the will, with two witnesses, two kosher witnesses, and therefore, as results of that, you know, they, they have to do exactly what, they, what he wrote in a will, if he used the language of Matana. Now what happened if the father dies without writing a will? Accident, something, he didn't get, to, nobody, nobody saw a will from him, there's nobody. Nobody come to claim that he left a will by me or anything like that. Today they do it with lawyers and all this, but in the old days he had to put it by someone he trusts, like the rabbi, if something happened to me, present my will. Let's see the order of inheritance according to the Torah. And then we will come to the conclusion, who should inherit this boy? This boy left now, who's going to get him? The parents are not there to inherit him because they died. Who comes first, the aunt or the grandparents? So this is the order, Rabotai, pay attention. The first one, if a person has boys, the boys automatically inherit him, and the first son, the firstborn, is getting two shares of the pie. Meaning if you have four kids and you left a million dollars, Four kids should have got 250,000 each, four boys. It doesn't go that way. The first boy count like two. So you actually have like five kids. 
So you divide the estate to five, you have a million divided by five, 200,000 each. Each one of the three young boys get 200, and the first one get 400, the first born. He get double than the others, unless you wrote a will. If you write in a will, I want to divide my money to my four boys equally as a gift, not as Yerusha. If you write Yerusha, also you make it not valid, because according to the Torah, automatically the firstborn gets double than all the others, right? What happens if your firstborn is a criminal, is Mechalel Shabbat? You don't want him to get a penny. Not only you don't want him to get double, you don't want him to get anything. And you have the three other righteous boys behind him. So you have to write in your life that everything I have will go to my three young boys equally, third, third, and a third, as a gift, bematana. Okay, you have to be very careful. So, if he doesn't have boys, only girls, then what happened? We learned from the Torah, the daughters of Tzlofchad came to Moshe Rabbeinu, and they say, our father died. He did not die in a machloket of Korach. That is, he's not a criminal. If, it was a, if someone does a machloket like this, he loses his share in the Holy Land. But since our father did not go against Moshe Rabbeinu, and he did not participate with Korach and his group, and he passed, we want to inherit his share in the Holy Land. Moshe didn't know what to do. And Hashem told them, they're right. If a man dies and he doesn't have boys, his girl inherit him. So now who comes second after the boys? The girls. Before the aunts, the uncles, the grandparents, grandchildren. First, boys. No boys, girls are taking it. What happened if the girl died? There was one girl, she had a, a child, a grandson, a boy or a girl, but she died now. There's no boys and no girls. He never had boys. He had one girl. She got married, age, uh, let's say, 14. Age 15, she already gave birth. Age 20, she died from a disease. The kid is five years old, grandson. No kids, only a one grandchild from the girl. Who comes next? The parents of the, or the grandparents or the grandchild? Grandchild from the boys, it's needless to say, because what the boys got, if they died, goes automatically to their boys, and to their boys, and to their boys. That's the way it is. So we got that, but we're not talking, there's no boys to begin with, only one girl. And she gave birth and died. And now she has a child or a grandchild. This grandchild will inherit the grandfather or the parents of the grandfather or his brother or his sister. Who's going to get it? The answer, the third one in the list is the grandchild. Even from a girl. So therefore, there was no boys the inheritance automatically goes to the girls. But the girl died. So who is going to get it? Her children. So what do we see? We have boys, then we have the girls, and then we have the grandkids. Right? If there are grandchildren from the, man, from the boy, let's say there was a boy and a girl, and the boy died, but he left a son, meaning a grandson. The grandson come before right? Because he inherited his father. The father was, was, is getting it like he's in his grave and his grandson is taking it from his father. But if there was no boys at all, then comes the girls and take it like they are the boys. So far everything is clear. You can repeat it later the video if you get confused. Once for all people, people are very confused with this. Now, next thing. What happened if there is no children at all. A man and a woman got married, they live together X amount of years, and they never had children. What happens? Who will inherit the father when he dies? The father died, his wife left. He left $10 million, and he has no children. Now the, the wife, if she inherit her father, 
her husband, I'm sorry, or no? The wife inherit her husband? The answer is no. The wife does not inherit her husband unless, like they do today, he leaves it to her in his lifetime already. He said to his children, whatever is gonna, I'm gonna leave, go to mommy. And then after that, it will go to you kids. But I'm not dividing my inheritance, meaning the wife will take it. That's like giving a gift. Gift, you can give to anyone, even to a stranger. It doesn't have to be a relative. But we are now talking that a man died without a will. What does the wife get? Only what's written in the Ketubah. The Ketubah, it's a document that protects the wives. If there will be a divorce, or there will be a, a husband deceased, the wife will get what the Ketubah say, and she comes before the boys. Before they divide the inheritance, they have to materialize enough to pay her their Ketubah. If you wrote her in a Ketubah, $300,000, and he left a building that worth a million dollars and no cash, she can come and say to the boys, you cannot take the building. You have to get on the building 300,000, first pay me my ketubah, and then the rest is yours. So she can force them to sell the building or take a loan on a building and pay her her ketubah, the loan will be on her name, on their name, and she's clear and free. So no matter what, a woman before she gets married, she has to be smart to make sure that the ketubah has a valid amount. Sometimes she's so much in love that she agreed to take $5,555.55. What can you buy? You cannot buy four tires from Mercedes with $5,000 today. What is she gonna do with that? You know, it happens to some women that the boys took everything and threw their mother to the dogs. Banim gidalti veromamti, vehem pashrubi. You see why we need you here? Baruch Hashem. So, what do we have here? If the husband died and he has no kids, like I said, the wife does not inherit him. Who comes next? The answer is on father, if he's alive. Reuven passed. His wife does not inherit him. He has no children. Who will inherit him? His father. His father, Yaakov. If he's alive. What happens if he's not alive, the father? His brothers will inherit him. Which one of them? He has three brothers. Which one of them? All three of them. It has to be divided by all of them. What happens if he does not have brothers? Uncles. What comes after uncles if they died in the meantime? Cousins. The son of the uncle. There is one exception to the rule. If a man died and he had no kids, his wife needs Yevum from one of his brothers. What does it mean, Yevum? It's an actual marriage. Of course, only if she agree. She may come and say, I don't like the brother. I cannot live with him. I cannot. <laughs> it's not my, uh, my taste. So what would be in that case? Like a get, chalitza. They come to the bedin, you know, he take off his shoe, spit on the shoe. It's a whole ceremony. And he gives her chalitza. Once she gets chalitza, she's free to marry anyone she wants. In the old days, usually it ended with one of the brothers getting married to the wife. And if they have a kid, they name the kid after the deceased brother that passed. Because that the brother agreed to marry his brother's widow, the Torah automatically make him inherit everything the brother left. Sometimes a very good deal. Imagine there is a, one of the brothers, he's young, let's say he's 30, and he's married already. He's married to one woman already. He has his own kids with her. And his brother died, his older brother, 40. He's 40, he died, and he left a wife, 30, 32, whatever. 
now the, the brother that is 30 years old has to marry her, to do Yevum. He may not like her so much, but he would like very much her bank account, meaning that his oldest brother may be left $20 million. So he can pretend, oh, of course I want to do Yevum. Of course, of course he wants to do Yevum. He gets $20 million for it. Beautiful house, let's see who's poor. For him, it's the best thing that could have happened. He takes his brother's uh, widow, if she agree, and if he agree, of course, if he likes her, whatever, something has to be there. If they like each other, he just got very lucky. He takes all the money with it. Now, what happens if all three brothers are fighting? Who's going to take her? They also want to be rich. <laughs> wow, it's not, who said that you're going to take her? I want to do Yivum. She likes me more. Let's ask her, who do you want? Me, him, or him? It's an awkward situation. What do you do in this case? Obviously, who the woman choose. You cannot force a woman to marry someone she doesn't like. So you ask her, do you have any preferences? Who would, who would you like for the three brothers? She said, this one, Moshe. If Moshe agree, he got lucky. He won the lottery. What happened if she said, I don't care, I like all three of them. They're all nice people. Maybe, the, maybe two of them are twins, Bechlal. She said, what difference does it make? Him or him? It's the same thing, no? Then in that case, who will come first? The oldest. If he doesn't want, the next one. If he doesn't want, the next one. If they go through all the brothers, none of them wanted. Maybe she, maybe she wasn't pretty enough. Maybe they should, he, their brother did not leave any money. Maybe they have a jealous wife. If you want to do your room with her, you can forget about me. There could be a lot of reasons. What happened in a case like this? They do chalitza. Today, everyone does chalitza. Why? If a brother dies, it happens sometimes. You have a brother, lo alenu, he died without kids. And you're the only brother. Sometimes you're single, sometimes you're married. According to the Torah, you had the option to marry her. So you have two wives now from the Torah. And you do, you But today nobody does it. Why? They all do chalitza automatically. If they have no kids and they are brothers, they do chalitza. Why is it? Because people are not holy like they used to be. They're not for the sake of heaven. Back then, it was really the main thing was to have a child to be called after my deceased brother. So I'm doing it for the mitzvah. Like her, don't like her. It's not so critical. If there is money, there's no money. People were much, much in a much higher level than today. Today, it's all physical. Barely anyone does it for the actual sake of heaven. So better just give Khalitza and let her go marry someone else and start a new life if she wants. So now, according to this, who comes first? The grandfather or the aunt? The aunt is one of the last one in the list. The grandfather come way before her. So according to the, if they would have to go to Sanhedrin, they would tell the, 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 the girl that the aunt Thank you very much for you being kind and you want to raise the kid. But he should go to his grandparents. Why? Bnei banim ke banim, the Gemara say. Sometimes a person does not have boys, like Rashi. Rashi had three girls, no boys. But then they had grandchildren, which were the, some of the biggest rabbis in the world, like Rabbi Nutam, Rivash, this Riban, all, this all, Rashbam. There's a big, big Rabbanim, almost as big as Rashi. A drop maybe less. His grandchildren. So grandchildren count like children. Bnei banim ke banim. That's why the Torah say you teach Torah to your son and to your grandson. It's, it's a clear verse. You have to teach your children and the children of your children. So wait a minute, we just discovered right now that it's not enough to teach Torah to your own kids. You have to teach Torah to your grandkids. So when will I have time to live? A person has six boys and 30 grandchildren. When is he going to be able to teach all of them Torah? 
The answer is, you only have to teach your grandchildren Torah if they have an idiot father. He doesn't teach them Torah, he's Amaretz, he himself doesn't know. So when your son is like this, go and save your grandson, because his son does, he does not fulfill his obligation. Today, almost nobody teaches children Torah, besides here and there learning with them an hour here and hour there. That's why we have yeshivot. You pay money, you nominate the rabbis to teach your kids Torah, and because you're the one who paid the money, it counts in Shamaim like you're the one who taught them Torah. You have to make sure to put them in a good school, not one of these modern rotten schools of New York or the rest of America, that they are more reformed than orthodox. Boys and girls, mix, all kinds of modern uh, rotten rabbis, university, apicorsim, you know, with a tiny quarter yamaka and a mentality of a goyim. That's not a yeshiva. That's a, that's a waste of time and illusion. You have to put them in a strict yeshiva. Problem is that sometimes the parents say, of course, I cannot compare this yeshiva to this yeshiva. You know, there's no question about it. But the problem is, I cannot put my son in such a strict yeshiva because I myself is not religious. How will I put him over there? He's going to become Hasidish. And he's going to look at me and his mother like two goyim. What, is he, what, what do you think is going to happen? He's going to come in three, four years from now and he's going to say to his father, hey, you behave like a shaget. <laughs> I have a friend. Baruch Hashem today is very religious. But back in time, like, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, we invited them for Shabbat. Very modern people back then. Oh, Hashem, they learn over the years. But they were in the first year that they became Baalei Tshuva, this family. They came to our neighborhood, which is a lot of Hasidish kids there. And they saw the dress, pink shirt, blue shirts, all kinds of things. The, the Hasidish kids, what did they know? Little kids. They started to call the children Shegets, Goyish, God, all kinds of things. <laughs> what are you doing here on Shabbos? They didn't believe they're Jewish, Bechla. They never saw anyone dress with pink shirt or flowers or blue shirt and have tiny yamakas like this and no long peos. For them it was something with lots of hair. They never saw it. It was the first time in a the block they saw somebody like this. They were a young little kid, I don't know, four or five. The trauma that this family had, for years they did not want to come to Monsi ever again for Shabbat. For years. Every time, no, no, we, we, it was enough for us. In my opinion, what really got them to become real Orthodox family is that day. Because as much as they made noise and passed about it, it burns them from inside that these little holy Hasidish kids actually thought that they are not Jewish by looking at them. Sometimes a person needs to be shaken up this Shabbat, we had a, an important guest came to Monsi, the son of Rav Ovadia Yosef Zatzal. He himself is a very big rabbi, he's the head of Yechevedat, and he sits in the comedy of the Gdolei Torah, Moetzet Chachmei Torah, Rabbi David Yosef. He was by me. Well, we had Baruch Hashem, was sitting, and uh, when he walked into my house, the moment we walked, we actually even filmed it. So, so he told me that he liked, well, actually, there was the introduction, like the first hello, hello, that he said to me like this, your name is mentioned many times over the years. You make a lot of noise. You're shaking people up. It's very good. That's the way it should be. Then he started to tell me everything about Rav Ovadia, all the things, how he used to call this speaker and used to call that speaker and instruct them what to say, what not to say. How to do Kiruv. Yes. Very interesting. Got some good tips from it. But the idea is that sometimes you have to make noise. If it's too quiet and relaxed, nobody's shake, nobody shaking up. 
Come in and out. Like, you know, in the library, how quiet it is over there. You go into the library, you can sit there for two hours, not one beep. If your phone rings, they look at you like a criminal. You come to a yeshiva, wow, so much noise. You cannot hear yourself. If you're going to get a phone call, no one will hear the ring. Nobody will hear the ring from the noise. Fire! With fire and screams, you learn a lot better than just review it with your eyes. So conclusion, Rabotai, we just saw another example how the secular court usually, or at least 90% of the time, will rule the opposite of what Hashem wants. It's a crime to go there. According to Halakha, you're not allowed to put mezuzah in a secular court. Not allowed. You're not allowed to step there. If you are sued and you are forced to go, you force. But you, to sue someone in a secular court, you become a criminal immediately. Even if the secular judges have among them a religious judge, believe it or not, some of those judges wear yamaka. Here and there you find. Of course, they're very wicked and nothing about them is religion. Make no mistake. But sometimes it can be confusing, like the Hasidish woman judge from Borough Park. She was religious. She covered her hair, she kept Shabbat, she eat kosher, she has religious kids in yeshivot. For whatever reason, the Satan fooled her and sent her to law school, and she became a lawyer, and she became a judge in a criminal court. Every one of her ruling is against Hashem. She has no choice. She has to follow the American Constitution. So when it happens among Goyim, the Goyim make their own constitution. That's what the Torah say. But when it happens to Jews, she may send an innocent Jew to jail. According to the Torah, he's innocent. But according to the law of America, he's a criminal. But according to the Torah, he's complete righteous. She has to send him to jail. I'll give you one example that it's very common. Someone told him what stock to buy. Friend knows the market, he has inside information. Next week, uh, this company will uh, publish their earning. And this broker knows someone from the company, and he said to him, hey, brother, buy a lot of uh, XYZ corporation, whatever. And he went and bought a lot of stocks, and next week it went up 20%. It just made a million dollars. Immediately, the FBI come to him, arrest him, freeze all his assets, put him five years in prison, and destroy his life. And she has to send him to prison. It's called inside trading, according to America. According to the Torah, nothing wrong was done here. Everyone has the right to tell anyone he likes, buy, sell. It's not, anyway, there's no guarantee. Things can always change. But if uh, my father wants to sell a big supermarket for half a price because he got old and tired, it's worth a million dollars, and he say, you know what? Even if I get half a million cash, I sell it. I don't care. Do I have the right to run to my best friend and tell him, listen, my father is about to sell it for half a million dollars to a stranger. Run, get it before he puts it in a newspaper. And he ran and bought it. Any crime was done here? According to the Torah, nothing. You may say, he got lucky. He got lucky. Hashem wanted him to make money. If Hashem wanted him to lose, believe me, a fine way to make him lose. So nothing wrong was done here, but according to, according to them, he's going to sit in prison. Or someone who did not pay enough taxes. He paid, but now they claim you hid uh, X amount of money. They send him to prison for X amount of years. According to the right, he doesn't need to sit in a prison. Even if he stole money, he had to pay double. That would be the it. So if he stole, for instance, $100,000 from the government, he would have to pay double. And today, anyway, there's no Sanhedrin, so there's no double. So technically, a lot of the rules that this judge has to rule automatically goes against Hashem. Every day. Make no mistake. There's not a day that she does not commit a huge crime. So she for sure lost her share to the world to come. Such a shame. A religious woman with religious education, raised religious kids, become a judge in a secular court. She's a moiser. Moiser 
If it's a man, you cannot count him in a minyan. You're not allowed to say hello to him. You're not allowed to marry his children. You're not allowed to do anything, anything to be affiliated with him. That's what the law is. Why? Because they are in the top of the list. It's terrible. So now if you're, if you're judging the Israeli Supreme Court, you sit there with a the yamaka. Rav Ovadi Yosef has a big answer about it. Terrible. That makes the law of the goyim or the law of the chilonim important in the eyes of the people. You build a fancy building, beta mishpat, supreme court. The court of whom? Of the most wicked, rotten, corrupted people. Who wrote those laws? Gays and thieves and mechalele shabbat and liars and people who receive bribe. You can count on their laws when you have a divine law next to you. So yeah, you are becoming a very serious criminal. If somebody gives you a gift that worth a thousand dollars, and someone gives you a gift that worth five dollars, and you put the garbage, the thousand on garbage, and you take the five, something is not right by you. Why would you give up such a precious gift for such a lousy gift? So Hashem gives us the Torah, we put it aside, and we follow the law of the Turks, and the Greeks, and the British. What, what kind of logic here? So that's a very serious crime. So to, to begin with, you're not allowed to step there at all. If there is a way not to go. So if you have to sue someone, you take him to bed in. But you're not allowed to sue them. What happened if the court ruled exactly what the Torah would have ruled? You are a tenant. You didn't pay the landlord. You owe him six months of rent, $6,000. If you go to a rabbinical court, that will be the ruling. What's, why did he even come to bed then? You're not denying you owe him the money, right? You live six months without paying rent. According to the Torah, you owe him the money. Pay him $6,000. That's it. That will be the ruling. Very easy case. If you go to a secular court, same thing. Maybe over there they give some penalty and interest. I don't know. But usually it's going to be the same ruling here. There's not that much to rule here. If you go, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, you as a Jew, religious Jew, you go to secular court and you win the case over there and the court order the other person to pay you exactly what you really deserve to get from the Torah. Exactly. You still consider a thief. The money that he will pay you because the secular court ruled it, count like you stole it from him, you're a thief. And thieves never make it to heaven. So if you would get it from the ruling of the bed dean, no problem. If you get it from a ruling of a secular court, you are a thief. So who wants to go to secular court? Only fools and ignorant. So that's very serious. Just one last thing we should know about the inheritance. As we already say, if there is... Someone that is a yav Yavam, he comes before everyone. He's taking the place of his deceased brother. Whatever his brother had belongs to him from now on. What happened? According to the Torah, in the beginning of the Torah, Sefer Bereshit, Av Avra Avraham said to Akadosh Baruch Hu, before he changed his name to Avraham, he was Avram. And he said to him, En li lo natata zera. You did not give me a child of my own. Avraham said to Hashem, Ve'ini ben beti oreshi oti. Who's going to inherit me? Eliezer, my servant. Right? According to the Torah, right? Avraham already tells you, if I had a son, he will inherit me. Now when I don't have a son, who will inherit me? I'm going to have to give everything to Eliezer. That's when Hashem told him, don't worry, you're going to have your own child. So from here, the, that's the first time the Torah talks about inheritance. Then the second time the Torah talks about inheritance is the daughter of Tzlofchad. That's when Hashem said, who comes first? Boy, and then a girl, and then a brother, and then the, 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 the uncle, right? And then after that, whoever left from the family, if, if none of this exists, right? Also, we should know that, that uh, there is also something that called 
Yerusha de Rabbanan, meaning it comes from the Chachamim. What does it mean? A convert. Once he converts, he has no more relatives. His biological parents are not considered his parents anymore. His brothers and sisters are not his brothers and sisters anymore. So basically he has no one in the world that relates to him besides Hashem. He's count like a brand new Jew that was born. Ketinok Shenolad. He was just born. So now, who will inherit him? You have Tony converted to Judaism. He has brothers and sisters when he, once he was a Goy. Now he became a Jew. Tony became Yosef. Yosef, after a year that he converted, he's a big businessman, he has millions, and he died. What are you going to do with his money now? He has no sons, no brothers, no sisters, no parents. Who will, go, who will inherit him? The Chachamim made Takana, a decree, that even though is no longer related to his biological relatives, right? Right? Still, the, the, the other way around, I'm sorry. If the parents of the Goy died, not the, meaning Tony, his father died, but Tony is not anymore the son of his father. His father, Vinny, died. So how is he going to inherit him? The answer, Takanat Chachamim. Even though you became a Jew and you're not related anymore to your father, when the father, the biological father died, you inherit him. What happened when, the, when Tony himself died? Who will inherit him? He has no relatives. Will his non-religious, will his non-Jewish relatives, biological relatives, will inherit him or no? The Xerah is Ger Tzedek Yoresh Et Horehu Hagoi. Right? But not the other way around. So one, once a Goy, a convert, dies, who inherit him? If in his lifetime he wrote a will, who he wants to give his money to, anyone he wrote gets it. If he died without a will, who inherit him? No, the bed din. It has to go for charity. At least they do something for him. Something to help his soul. What happened when a Jew died and he left very little money? There, is, there are boys. Let's see, there are five boys. But he only left $10,000. That's it. If you divide it between those five boys... Each one will get 2,000. And the girls, what's going to happen with him? The answer, because it's such a small amount, the Chachamim made a decree that it will go to the girls. Why? Because the girls will need something to leave. And the father did not leave enough to support the girls. In case like that, the girls will get first. Even though from the Torah, the boy should have got it. The Chachamim made a decree that the girls will get it. And what's going to happen with the boys? The boys will collect. We'll knock on doors. Our father died. We don't have money. Help us. Why the boys cannot say, why should I collect? Like my sister collect. She's pretty and everyone will give her money. To me, nobody will give anything. Let her go. If they see a young 16 years old girl coming to collect, I'm hungry, of course they'll give her. Right or wrong? What's the problem over here? There's many problems. First of all, modesty. It's not safe to send a girl to someone's house. You see that she's alone, poor. Chas v'shalom, who knows what he can do to her. Psychos you always had. Not only today. You always had psychos. Second, chas v'shalom, it can become kiddushin, maybe. He gives her the money, chas v'shalom, or something. All of a sudden, she's going to need a get from Safek. And is bizayon lebat Israel, a Jewish girl, to send her to knock on doors to collect charity, is really a disrespect for the girl. That's why, by the way, girls do not act as witnesses in a court. 
They don't. They don't go to court. And you don't accept a testimony from a woman. Why is it? Few reasons. One, the other side will investigate her and humiliate her. Hashem does not agree that a woman's dignity will be put on a stand. Absolutely not. But there's another reason. Women, when they act, they act from the brain or they act from the heart? The answer is both. But usually, almost always, the heart will be dominant. Meaning, of course, she has a brain. Smart, she could be a lawyer, she could be a doctor. She understands what's going on, and she's very clever, and everything is beautiful. But once emotions will be involved, women cannot tolerate the emotional pain. It would clot their mind completely. For instance, if they would see a rich landlord and a poor tenant, and the landlord threw the tenant to the street and he's freezing outside, and now on top of it, he brings him to court and wants to sue him for the last month rent that he didn't pay. And, he's, and the woman would see the poor tenant crying, shivering, and the arrogant rich guy with his thousand dollars tie sitting there with his cigar, you know, with his expensive watch. And he looks at the miserable tenant crying, I have no life, I don't know where I'm gonna sleep, your honor, da 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 da. And the, and the landlord like this, what is it my problem? I want two thousand dollars. It will be very difficult for the woman to make justice. According to the Torah, the poor owe the money to the rich. <laughs> what can you do? That's the that's the law, the law of the Torah. But she won't be able to go against the miserable one. It will be very difficult because she won't be able to sleep for a week. It will break her heart. Or if it's going to be a case with orphans, right? She, she's going to go with her heart. Or if she's going to be, if she's going to be kidnapped. A woman should not be a soldier in a, com in a combat. Why? If the Goim will capture her and put her in a prison, what do you think the first thing on her mind will be? I will say and give out any secret of the army and the state as long as they don't do something to me. What they usually do to women prisoners. So for her, she rather die and destroy the whole world as long as no stranger will do something to her by force. That's why you don't put her in such a situation. Today the world is so messed up. Everything is the opposite of Hashem. Everything. They send women, fragile women, to be pilots, to drive a tank, to shoot. What kind, what kind of, uh, of society we have? Everything is the opposite. Instead of taking care of them, giving them uh, you know, good life, raising their children, being some good housewife and, you know, and not to put them in a stand or in a war or in a psychological mental pressure. Today, they want to make the women as men and they want to make the men as women. And we finish this part of the introduction. Let's move to our topic tonight. Uh, as we know, in Shabbat, we read about Avraham Avinu, Abraham, right after he circumcised himself and his family and all, all the servants. And as you know, when a person is circumcised, the third day is the most critical day. And then the third day, when Avraham is supposed to be laying in bed and relaxing from the pain until he heals, he has only one thing on his mind. What happened? He sits by the entrance of his tent and looking for guests. He cannot live a day without having guests. Hospitality. All the Middle Eastern people in the world that you meet today, there's always going to be some exception to the rule, of course. But in any country you go, all the Middle East are children of Abraham. <coughs> Everyone. All the Arabs, the Jews, everyone eventually are all from Abraham Avinu. You go in every house of every Middle Eastern citizen and you walk inside and check the hospitality. 
beyond words. Walk into a Bukharian house, walk to a Kafkazi house, walk to Iraqi, Persian, Syrian, Lebanese, Egyptian, every Moroccan, everyone you moved in, from the minute you walked in, you're going to feel like a king. Everybody runs, serving this, non-stop. Even if they hate you. He's a Muslim terrorist. You come into his house, hospitality must be tapped. Tap. Not only that, if you do not eat from their food, they get very offended. If you come to an American, European, and he serves a few things on the table, and you don't eat. I know I'm sorry, I already had lunch, I can't eat. They don't make a big deal out of it. If you come to a Middle Eastern person and they, suggest, and they put food on the table and you refuse to eat, you're done. They, will, they literally will cry over it. They're so insulted. You're insulting us. You're killing us. Please, Rabbi, have something. Why is it? Maase avot siman lebanim. We inherit it from generations. It's all started by Avraham Avinu. He's the number one in hospitality. He's suffering pain. Hashem made the day the hardest day ever. Kechomayom. Imagine like 120 degrees. Maybe even more. And what does he do? He's looking for guests. And who shows up? Three Arabs. They're not real people. The angels coming in a custom of three Arabs. What does it mean, three Arabs? How there was Arabs? Ishmael was only 13 years old. He just made Brit Milah to himself and to Ishmael. Ishmael is the father of all Arabs. Right? All the Ishmaelim. Arabs, Egyptians, Palestinians, Iraqis, Lebanese. They all came from who? From Ishmael. Not all Muslims are from Ishmael. Persians, Turkish, Uzbekistan, Nigeria, they are nothing to do with the Arabs. They're a different nation who later adopted Islam. But they're not the children of Ishmael. But the Arabs, those who speak Arabic, those are the children of Ishmael, with some exception to the rules. There could be Europeans who moved to an Arab country five generations ago and their children are Europeans, but they don't know it. That's why you have sometimes Arabs with light skin and green eyes. They don't really look Ishmaelim. It's probably a few generations ago their parents moved to an Arab country. But overall, the Arabs are the children of Ishmael. But not all Muslims are children of Ishmael. At least half of the Muslims in the world have nothing to do with Ishmael. Indonesia. They have nothing to do with Ishmael. All the Africans in Africa, a lot of them are Muslims. They have nothing to do with Ishmael. All the Iranians, they have nothing to do with Ishmael. All the Turkish, they have nothing to do with Ishmael. And probably in China, there are two million Muslims. They have nothing to do with Ishmael. In many, many countries, you have Muslims that have nothing to do with Ishmael. Like in India, maybe even in Pakistan, they have nothing to do with Ishmael. Just the Arabs are the children of Ishmael. So how is it possible that three Arabs are coming to Abraham if the first Arab is his child and he's only a kid and he wasn't married yet? The Torah would say later that he got married. So what? His children were born before Ishmael became a man without a wife? Do you understand the question or no? The answer is, what does it mean Arabs? The word Arab, Aravi, come from what word? Aravi come from the word Arava. Arava, what's Arava in the Shona Kodesh in Hebrew? Desert. Aravi doesn't mean Ishmaeli. Aravi means people that live in a desert. When the, the Gemara say three Arabs are coming, that means nothing to do with Ishmael. They're not Arabs, like we, we interpret Arabs. It's people that live in a desert, in tent, like the Bedouin. That's it. Today, because almost all the people in the world that live in the desert are, are Ishmaelim, we call them Aravim. 
It's very interesting because עברי and ערבי is the same letters. אברהם העברי, right? עין, בית, רש, יוד. ערבי and עברי it's the same letters in different order. So three Arabs are coming and he runs to them. Avram runs to them and he bow down to them. You know? Look at his manners. Strangers. Doesn't know them. He bow down to them. Vayomer and he say gentlemen, plural. Gentlemen, from this moment on he changed the language. He speaks in single language, not plural. He refers only to the middle one, not to all three. Im na matzati chen be'enecha, if I find favor in your eye. Al na ta'avor me'al avdecha, please do not pass and not come into my house. Speaking only to one of the three. Because, you know, in Shona Kodesh, when you speak to one individual, there is a certain language. And when you speak to a group of people, the language is different. It's not like in English. When you say it to English, it to someone, you. You can be you speaking to one person. You can be five people. That's why in America, they see there's a problem in the language. So now they found a way, you guys. <laughs> Otherwise, how are you going to know you speak to a group? If you say you, you speak to someone on the phone and you're listening, you're trying to understand who your son is talking to. So you say, so you're coming to us for Shabbat? Who is you? You is one or the whole family, ten? It can be both. But in Hebrew, you cannot make that mistake. If you speak to one person, if it's a man, you say ata. If it's a woman, you say at. If it's a group, you say atem. So from the actual language, you know if you're talking to a man or a woman or a group of people. And in English, it's not like that. So they have to say, so you guys are coming? Or you are coming, it could be both. Tough. So Avraham changed the language, now he speaks only to one of them. Says Rav Avigdor Miller Zatzal, from here we learn every verse in the Torah, it's a school for life. Remember, it's a divine book. Hashem designed what words to put in the Torah, what words not to put in the Torah. From the whole story, sometimes only one or two sentences coming into the Torah. There could be another 50 that did not enter the book. The Torah is very brief. Very, very brief. The Torah does not... The Torah does not waste a word unless it has a message. Soon we're going to see what I'm talking about, clearly. So, why all of a sudden Abraham in the beginning say hello to all of them, and from this moment he only speak to the middle one? Says Rav Victor Miller, from here you learn manners. When you have a group of people coming, you do not speak to all of them at the same time. You only speak to the highest among them as a respect. For instance, if the President of the United States come with five bodyguards, with all the respect to the bodyguards, they are only here thanks to him. Nobody really cares about them right now. So you only speak to the President, Mr. President. You don't say you guys are coming to eat lunch with us? That's an insult to the President. When you suggesting that him and his five bodyguards who works for him or his driver are all at the same level in your eyes. That you're inviting all of them. You don't do it like this. You speak to the leader, if he's a rabbi, and regular students. You don't care right now about the students. You only speak to the rabbi. The entire time, you do not ever speak to anyone that is less than him in a level right now. Once you're done with him or he left, then you talk to the others. Over here, Abraham speak to the main one. Now when you have three people coming towards you, how do you know who is the main one? The answer, the middle one. I'll give you an example. If you see Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal, 
and the Chazonish are walking in a street with one person that you do not recognize walk between both of them. On his left, Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal. On the right, the Chazonish. And you don't know who's the one in the middle. What do you know right away? Without knowing who he is. That this one is a bigger rabbi than both of the rabbis who walk on his right and on his left. Why? Because they would not make him walk on the side knowing that he's greater than them. So if we are two young rabbis and Rav Ovadia Yosef would come and ask us to escort him when he walks from here to there, two blocks, are we going to put him on the side or obviously he's going to walk in the middle and each one of us will be on the side? These are simple manners. Today, I, I guess not everybody understands those manners, but in many countries, it will be obvious even to Goim that that's what should be done. For instance, you will never see a prime minister, a, a prime minister or a president walk on a side and someone who is less than him walks in the middle. Even the Goim understands that. Today, people don't care so much about respect and manners, but in some countries it's very important. Like in Turkey, if you come to a house of an important person, right away you kiss his hand and he puts his hand on your head, meaning giving you permission to talk. It's always the custom. Or if somebody important walks into the room, immediately everyone rises. Just like here in the court. When the judge comes in, immediately everyone rises. You don't need people to tell you, please rise. They announce it. But a normal person, when you see a judge comes in, automatically everybody stands. Even though he doesn't deserve one gram of respect, this gay judge, wicked from Sodom, but the law is the law. What can you do? For them, he's a hero. For the Torah, he's wicked. But in the United States, they respect judges. So if everybody rise, don't rebel. You know, it's like in Israel, when they have the Memorial Day for the soldiers, Israel was funded by wicked people, all communists, anti-God, anti-religion, all communists from Russia and Poland. Even though 35 years before them, the first immigrants that came to Israel were all religious from Europe. All very, very ultra-Orthodox uh, Jews came from Europe. They came into Israel, when, everyone was when everything was swamps and malaria and mosquitoes and people were dying from fever, it was 1880, 140 years ago. Later, 1917, 37 years later, one huge amount of Russian and Polish Jews from, uh, from Russia and Poland came to Israel in the second wave of immigration, Aliyah Shnia, and all of them were wicked. Communist, wicked, all eat non-kosher, all of them chalalei Shabbat, and the worst part is they all have ideology of communist goyim. That was their ideology. By the way, I know you're going to be shocked to hear that if I had to choose today to listen to a lecture of David Ben-Gurion, the famous wicked first prime minister of Israel, or to some of the speakers you have here in New York that speaks on YouTube, I would rather listen to him. He was more, more accurate in religion, in religion than them. They call themselves rabbis. Some of them are complete apicorsim. He, when they spoke to him, he said, everything is from God. And we sit in the land because God gave us the land. And when he went to the United Nations, he held the Tanakh. In the name of this book, we have the right on Israel. That's our deed. And many of the things that he said in his life was more orthodox than some of these university speakers that you hear today. That, make no mistake, is still 100% wicked. But compared to them, he's a rabbi. Compared to them. And some of them you are listening to. I have a list. I have a list of 15 of them. All these infidels. Some of them have nice beers. They make impressions, sombrero. But they are nothing but wicked Mahdi Arabim. With their rotten ideology. So I want to tell you something. Ben-Gurion one time met the Chazonish. 
They asked ben, uh, Chazonish, you agree that the Prime Minister Ben Gurion will come to meet, to you, meet you? The Chazonish answered, my door is open to everyone. <laughs> Meaning, he can come, but for me is nothing. Just like anyone who comes from the street. But they brought him anyway. Later, Ben Gurion said that the most amazing meeting he ever had with someone was those minutes that he spent with the Chazonish. He never saw in his life such a smart person. We don't need his approval for that. We all know it. But even him with his ego and, the, and they used to read a lot of books, these communists. They were very intellectual. He felt that the Chazonish is unbelievable. By the way, in that meeting, Ben Gurion decided to exempt all the learners of Torah from the Israeli army until today, more than seven years. All people who sit and learn Torah full time do not go to the army because of that meeting. In that meeting, he wanted to send Jewish girls to the army. Okay, the boys learn Torah. Okay, let them learn Torah. But what about the girls? She can be secretary, she can make coffee, she can clean, she can help in the army. We need women. The Chazonish told him, it's better you take all the boys from the yeshivot into the, uh, into the army and close all the yeshivot and do not take one Jewish girl into the army. Until today, religious Jewish girls do not have to go to the army. They do sherut leumi, meaning social service. They work in a hospital, in a, in a, not in the army. And they get credits for the time they do. She's a secretary, she's that, she's doing working in a hospital, she's a nurse, she's a... Everyone, they find her what to do. She doesn't have to be in the army. Many girls are secular, they go to the army, and that's the end of them there. Boys, girls in the same dorm, horrible. Sodom and Gomorrah under the supervision of the Israeli army. Sodom and Gomorrah, mamash there. I don't want to tell you how many abortions they have over there. In the last uh, few decades, there were thousands of abortions just in the army alone of 18, 19 years old girls that goes to the army. You raise a girl, you put your life into her. You hope that one day she get married and have her own children and decent family. And then you send her to serve the state. She goes to the army and one uh, lunatic attacks her and destroy her life. And then she has to murder the baby. And I don't have to tell you how the rest of their future is gonna look. So Ben Gurion said, how did you know that I will never dare to send those girls to the, to the uh, that I will never ever actually close the yeshivot and send the guys into the army? And you gave me, you made me such a trick. You told me better you close all the yeshivot and send one girl into the army. So in the end, in that meeting, no guys goes to the army if they learn Torah and no religious girl goes to the army. In Israel, some girls do not want to go to the army. They pretend to be religious. They come to the first interview, dressed for the first time in their life, modest. He used to work. They ask her some questions about religion. She prepares. And they see that she's really religious, supposedly. And they, and they give her a dismissal. The problem today is that you have Facebook. There's an eye who watch over you and film you every second. And if you put one picture of you online, you're done. It will travel and go here and go there. All they do, these Israelis, right away they check their name in a search. Oh, religious. Psh, a real rabbit sand. Look at her picture over here on the beach. She's Mamash Rabbanit from Bnei Brak. Come back. What is this? <laughs> what are you going to do? So today it's hard to lie to them. They check everything. You can go into your phone and see what, what's in there. They can do whatever they want. It used to be easy. Not anymore. So now most of the girls ended up in the army. So let's move on. 
So Avraham speaks only to the middle one. אם נא מצאתי חן בעיניך, אל תעבור מעל עבדיך. I want to invite you for meal. What meal? I will slaughter three cows for you. One for each person. With all due respect, take the hungriest person on earth. You know these gorillas that eat? I know one guy ate eight pies of pizza and 13 sabarina cakes in one evening. 13... Eight pies of pizza. I don't know how big the pies were. Maybe mini pies, maybe large pies. I don't know. I wasn't there. But it was for a thousand shekel bet. A few hundred bucks. It was a bet between friends. How much you give me if I finish eight pies and 13 sabarina cakes? You know how sweet sabarina cake? You take two bites, you faint. In America, for whatever reason, every pastry, everything they bake, have three times the amount of sugar. Not only that it's not healthy, and it's very fattening, and everyone is chubby or more, that's besides the point. It's not tasty. It's, not, it's really not tasty. It's so sweet, it gives you a headache. I always say to the, the, the girls that bake, whatever the recipe say, cut immediately the sugar by 50%. Not for health reasons. For taste reasons. It will be much tastier. Not only that, they make cakes that is so sweet, full of dates, and they put sugar powder on top. Do you know how sweet are dates? You know those smashed dates that they put in those cookies? Do you know how sweet they are? They're sweeter than sugar. Why would you spread on top of it tons of white powder? Why? That's exactly the answer she gave me. For the beauty. The beauty is more important than the taste. The eyes may be tough. Tough! So I, I, why does Avram need to slaughter three cows? One cow is not enough for three guests? Believe me. Just the ribs of the cow, it's enough for 30 people. It's a cow. You know, how much meat you have? Choose! I'm going to put tons of meat on the table. One cow. You will eat and I will have one ton of meat left for all my servants for a week. There's no refrigerator, so everybody will have to come and eat. Tomorrow it will be spoiled. So why, why would you slaughter three cows? The answer the Gemara say, I would like to give you the tongue of the cow. There's a name for it. What's the name of it? When you serve tongue in a restaurant, they have a different name for it. The, to the meat. All right, let's call it tongue, as long as you know what I'm talking about. I don't get it. Did you ever see the size of the tongue of the cow? Do you know how long it is? Longer than my whole arm. Very, very long. Even that tongue is enough for all three of them. Cut it to three thirds. Give each one of them a piece of tongue and extra, some ribs, some, you know, other things. It's plenty, no? The answer is it's not fair. Each third of the tongue tastes different than the other. The deeper it goes into the throat, the thicker it gets. Only the edge is thin. But inside, it's very thick. If you cut it, it's three thirds. Each taste is different. It's not fair. I want all of you to have the whole tongue from the beginning to the end. Tom, if you're so generous, just in case you didn't know, how much a cow costs today? If you want to buy a cow, before you slaughter it, $5,000. You're going to make it $15,000 after you clean everything and sell it in a butcher shop. Every piece of steak in a kosher shop, 20, 25, some, some, there are some meat, $80 a pound. I don't know what's so special about it, but it, there is such thing, $80 a pound. So if you add all the meat that uh, comes from one fat cow, $15,000 
profit minus the 5,000 you pay for the cow. Very good business, no? That's why everybody wants to have a butcher shop. Very good business. So I want to ask you now. If Avraham is willing to cut three cows, meaning to spend in today's value $15,000 for three Arabs, idol worshippers that came out of nowhere in the hardest day of the year or, or the hardest day of the history, I should say, while he's suffering tremendous pain in the third day of his circumcision. Did you ever find in the history someone who treat the guests better than him? No. So I don't understand. The next verse, Yukach na me'at ma'im. We will give you a little water that you should wash your legs. Why a little water? You're willing to spend $15,000 on us on meat. Water is not expensive. Why when it comes to the water you cheap? The answer is, Rabotai, we don't have a faucet here. You press a button and the water comes out. I have to send the boy to go get water from the lake, from the river, from a well. He has to carry it up the hill. It's very heavy. You need to bring water to wash the legs of three people. Do you know how heavy it is? What comes to me? I'm very generous and I run and I sweat for you and I serve you like a servant. What has to come by someone else, I will try to give him as less as possible of suffering. Meaning... I don't want him to suffer, to, go, to have to go a few times to bring water. So a little bit, manage with a little water. What do we learn from here? Don't be generous with someone else's money and effort. If it's your effort, no problem. You decide how much you want to invest. Throw it on your friend and put him in a situation that he will be embarrassed to say no. And now he's going to have to do something against his will or to work extra hard. Don't do it. It's not kosher. Chafetz Chaim, when he used to come to the mill, he used to wash with very little water. There was a lot of water there. Why? He doesn't want the servant to have to go get more water because of him. So I'll manage with the minimum amount that I can use. Why? I don't want someone else to suffer. One time, the, he came to a mill. I think it was Rav Israel Misalant the founder of the Musar movement. Friday night, he, came, he was invited by someone rich. Quickly, he did Kiddush and finished everything quickly. The whole meal. Let's bench. No Shalom Aleichem, no Eshet Chayil, no nothing. The, the, the rich guy said, Rabbi, what's the rush? Let's sing some Zmirot Shabbat. Said, after, after, later. Let's first finish. Let's make Birkat Amazon. After that, we can sit and enjoy. Why, why was, what was all this about? There's a, there's a maid. She cannot go home to do Shabbat with her husband and her kids until she finished to clear the table and wash everything. So you're going to keep her until 11 and her poor husband sitting at home waiting after he came from shul. That's how it used to be. People walk by other people's house. So he said, I'm going to sit and enjoy and, and, and uh, talk and sing. And eat and dessert and, uh, you know, and then she's her entire night thinking, when will I finally go to do Kiddush with my husband and my children? He finished the whole thing in less than half an hour. And he said, if you're clear, you can go. We're done. You're done. You finish your, your job for tonight. A kosher person not only think about himself, always think about the other first. First, what's good for you? Then what's good for me? Today the world is so selfish that nobody cares at all about the other. At least if you think, okay, what's good for me? And then what's good for you? Oh. I give you an example. If you give someone a loan as a second mortgage on his home, second mortgage, the bank gave him first mortgage and you give him second mortgage. So he gives you, you put a lien on his property. Second mortgage is basically a toilet paper. Right now it's here on a shelf, another second is in the sewer. 
it has no value. Why? Because as soon as the person defaults on his loan, the bank will take the house for the auction and sell it right away. And the last thing they care about is you. As long as they cover what they gave. And they sell it in the auction and you're left with nothing. The bank won't say, wait a minute, there's another person who gave another $100,000, here is a second mortgage. We cannot agree. We have to cover us and we have to cover that individual. Nobody cared. They only care about themselves. This is the nature today. Everyone was trained and educated to care only about himself. And that's the exact opposite of the Torah. First thing Hashem look at you is, do you think about others? When you go to someone's house for Shabbat, do you leave the, all the lights, all the, the air condition, things that you don't do in your own house? You're all of a sudden very generous. Why in your house you're not so generous? Because you pay. When you go to someone else, you're very generous. When you drive your car, you're very gentle. When someone lends you a car, you kill the car on your driving. Woo, woo, ah, boom, paddles, you don't care. Why? Because you're a selfish person, ungrateful. Judaism is all about educating you to be a decent, grateful human being. Sometimes you'll be a robot that keeps all the mitzvot, and in reality you're still a selfish, egoistic person that may have no gratefulness whatsoever. And that's how the children in America are growing today, with such level of selfishness that they cannot appreciate anything. When is the last time an American kid picked up his own towel from the floor after he took a shower? Without waiting until the maid will come and do it, or his mother. When is the last time an American kid put his shoes back in the closet after he took them off? Without throwing it in the middle of the room. When did an American kid ever hang his coat after he came when it's wet from the rain and he threw it somewhere? put it on a nice hanger or put it where it's supposed to dry. When? When did it happen? Show me. I will be very happy to see that kid. That's what's happening today in the world. Why? Once you have no Torah in school, they raise them like monkeys. Monkeys in a safari. They do. When monkeys do whatever they like right now to do. They don't have decency. They see someone, they throw a coconut on his head and smash his head. They don't care. They don't have, oh, wait a minute, it's not decent what we're about to do. There are monkeys. Unfortunately, some people today are even worse than monkeys, and that's very sad. So Avraham, take some water, a little bit, wash your legs, and please come and sit under the tree. Shed. It's very hot. Remember, it's the hottest day ever, and there was no air condition yet. So where would you, would you put them? Under the sun? Who can enjoy a meal when 120 degrees and the sun is on your head? And you're dying and sweating. Come to the shed, here. And I will take some bread, meaning food, and eat. And then you can go. They say to him, okay, we accept your offer. Vayemaher Avraham, he rushed. He always rushed. Always the Torah emphasizes Abraham do not just move slow. He rush. When Hashem say go and take your son and slaughter him, Vayashkem Avraham baboker. First thing, before you even saw the light, right away is up ready to go, preparing his donkey for the for the way. Here, Vayemaher Avraham Aoela. He runs to Sarah. Marish lo seim kemach solet. Take flower. Lushi vasi ugot. Make the dough and prepare bread. What does it mean ugot? What in, in proper Hebrew language, what does it mean uga? Something round. Today in modern Hebrew we use it for cake. Uga it's cake. But from the Torah language, uga it's agol. It comes from the word agol. It's round. Reminds you of what? 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 What round we eat? 
matzah. Or if you're Bukharian, there's also bread. You know this red, Bukharian bread, that you can break someone's head with it before you put it in the oven? Before you put it in the oven, it, it can be a great killer. Throw it in someone's head, it's a dead sen- sentence. After you put it in the, in the oven, it's the most delicious bread ever. You know, it's very interesting. So, it was Pesach. Make matzot, quickly. Tov. Tov, so Sarah quickly is doing what Avraham told her. Ve'ela bakar ratz Avraham. To the cattle, sprint. Ah, what's the rush? Walk. The guest is hungry from the road. Every second here uh, is in this critical. The faster I can make the food, the better it is. Run. Vayikach ben bakar achvatov. He chose the calf. Soft skin, soft meat. Rach means soft, tov, the best one, good one. Vayiten el anar. Come, help me. Let's do the shechita, the slaughtering. Vayimayer la'asot oto. Right away, put it on the fire. Vayikach em avichalav. Oh, oh. Something went wrong here. Now he brings butter and milk. What are you serving them? Steaks together with butter and milk? Basar v'chalav? How can it be? It's a sin from the Torah. You cannot eat meat and, and meat. And, and, and cheese or milk you cannot do it. You may say, wait a minute, the Torah was not given yet. It's Abraham Avinu, it's hundreds of years before the Torah was given. Only once the Torah was given, the Torah said, Lot Evashel Gedi Bachalev Imo. But now it's before the Torah was given. Right? The Torah was given a few generations after Abraham. We had Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. Who comes from Yaakov? Levi. Who comes from Levi? Ah? Huh? No, after Levi. Who's the son of Levi? Kehat, right? Amram and Moshe. How many generations? Six. Six generations. It's at least 200 years, I, I, I would guess, if you do the math. So what's the, what's the problem? Let them eat. Steak with some butter, like the Goim do. With cream. Supposedly delicious, No. Somebody asks you, why are you not allowed to eat steak with cream on it? With milk. Cooked in milk. Why? Why? Is it not healthy? Maybe not. But that's not the reason. What's the reason? The answer, because Hashem said so. You're looking for logic? What logic are you going to find? What logic? Show me. You take a steak from this butcher shop, you go across the street to the supermarket and you buy their cream, cream cheese, I don't know, whatever you like to put on a steak. Put it together. It's a sin. Why? By the way, use your head. For those who ask, is the Torah is from God or people wrote it? Ask yourself a question. If you think that a person wrote the Torah, Find me that person that was so messed up in his head to make up such a strange law. What would he gain? What does he care if you eat steak and drink milk at the same time? Or put the, the sauce, make a dairy sauce. Like they go in, they love it very much. In restaurants, they serve it all the time. And it's healthy. Nobody died from it. I never saw a guy that died from a... Steak with butter, or cheese, or anything like that, or cheeseburger. Did you ever see a guy die from cheeseburger? No. So the answer is, what human being would make such a strange law? Who would invent such a law? What would you gain from it to forbid such thing? If you think, how can it be that you're going to eat the mother and the baby at the same time? Who told you that you have to do the mother and the baby at the same time? You can do a mother from here and a baby from there. Meaning, the, you know, what's, what is the, 
Find me one logical reason for it. The answer is none. Why did Hashem made it? We will understand when we go up to heaven. That's it. If the Mashiach would come before, then he will explain to us all the secrets of the, of the, the 613 commandments. The only one who knew them, all of them besides one, was King Solomon. Because he got a, wis a divine wisdom as a gift. It's like Hashem inserted, inserted a, a CD in his brain. With all the secrets of the life, of the world, of the languages, of the animals and the trees. Everything that you can possibly know. It was just a drop, a little bit less than Hashem in his knowledge. That's how great he was. It's a gift. No one can ever be 1% smart like King Solomon. He was the king of the world when he was 12 years old. 12. Already a judge. So, the point is that one mitzvah he didn't know. He said, this mitzvah is above my ability. Which one? Red cow. Meaning everything else he knew. Not only that, he said that every mitzvah from the Torah has how many reasons behind it? 3,000. 3,000 reasons. How many of the 3,000 we know? Best case scenario, four. Best case scenario. From what I review over the years in the explanation of some of the mitzvot. How many reasons they can give you, the chachamim? You know what? To be on the safe side, let's say five. Okay? To be sure. That's it. That's what we have left. From the 3,000 reasons he knew. And for every rabbinical mitzvah, every rabbinical decree, how many reasons you have? We barely know one or two. How many reasons the Chachamim had? You won't believe it. 1,005 reasons. Today, clowns, that's the only word you can call these people. Clowns, I barely know how to read the sentence in Hebrew. Barely. Most of them don't even know that. They never read the Torah once in their life. And they don't understand anything, basically. Nothing. Not only not Torah. Anything in their life they don't understand. They totally messed up in their head. You have to see the videos they make against the Torah. You don't know if to laugh or to cry. And you see these morons, the nonsense that they talk about. You don't know if to laugh or to cry. This is, this is such a joke. The problem is that a lot of fools buy these jokes. It's unbelievable how wicked people, when they hear a conspiracy or some nonsense video on YouTube, they adapt it like it's a divine knowledge. Corona, vaccine, 5G, all these millions of conspiracies. Government, Illuminati, the Rockefeller, the new Hitler, Bill Gates, and this, and diluting the population. And ah, I have a list from here to Zimbabwe of conspiracies. People actually live by these conspiracies. People actually change their entire life. Every one of the conspiracies, they signed their life on it without having any knowledge who made that video, what's really true, what's not true. They accept it as a fact. The only thing that can be proven without a doubt that is divine and true is the Torah. And when it comes to the Torah, everything they deny. How can it be? At least you would say, I'm a rational person. I do not buy any baloney unless I investigated myself from A to Z carefully a few times. I don't believe in anything. Don't believe in God. Don't believe in a Torah. Don't believe in YouTube. Don't believe in a government. Don't believe in a vaccine. Don't believe in a virus. Don't believe in anyone. Nobody. Oh, at least you're consistent. You're a suspicious person. Don't believe in anything. Fine. But why all of a sudden when some lunatic 
that, that, that take drugs every hour just to pass, to pass the day, he makes uh, some conspiracy video on YouTube, immediately it becomes a fact for you. When someone proves to you that the Torah is divine and has a lot of knowledge and divine information there, you give your life to fight against it. Where is the logic here? The answer is, that's called evil inclination. Yet Evil inclination. Why would a woman wear high heels? Do you know anything more stupid than that? To walk all day on two pencils like this and suffer, break your back, break your knees, break your ankles. Cannot go, cannot walk, suffer all day. All day she has to walk like this. You know, whenever she goes to the office to walk, to the wedding. Why, what for? For 10 minutes attention. The people would look at her the way she looked. Wow, it's very nice. She's willing to take all the suffering. Why is it? <laughs> Lack of common sense. Suffer eight hours for 10, 20 minutes combined attention. From whom? From people you would not even care about. Really, think about it. There's a guy in India, already a few decades, he walks with his mother sitting on his shoulders, all day, everywhere. He puts his mother in a basket. <laughs> no, it's for real. All day, every day, no matter where he goes, his mother sits in a basket. That's his religion. I was wondering what he does when he needs the bathroom, where he puts her. <laughs> Maybe anger by the window? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if we go over all the crazy people in the world, we will need to live to the year 80,000. Just to go one by one. You'll never end. Bottom line, Rabotai, Avraham is now running to prepare the cows. They prepare it. Why all of a sudden he brings dairy? No, no question at all. We do it in Shavuot. We eat dairy, we rinse them out, and we eat meat right after that. You don't need to wait between dairy and meat. You just eat pizza, you rinse your mouth carefully, that you don't have cheese left. And right away, you can eat steak. The other way around, you can do it. If you already took one bite of the meat, finished. You cannot eat six hours of dairy. But if you eat dairy first, no problem. You can eat right away after that meat. Some Ashkenazim, if they eat hard cheese, you know those cheese that you can break someone's head with? Goes together with the Bukharian bread, Benji. So if you don't get killed from the cheese, you get killed from the bread. So this cheese, it takes longer to digest, so they also wait a few hours. But there's really no obligation, because there's no such thing in a Gemara that you, after you ate dairy, you have to wait. So Avram served them appetizers. Some dairy stuff, I don't know what he made, omelets, this, you know. Before the steaks will be ready, it takes time to make the steak. Huh? No problem. You may say, but wait a minute, why do you need to, to give me this reason? It was 200 years before the Torah was given. Avraham already kept all the Torah, everything. The Gemara say, all the mitzvot of the Torah Avraham kept besides one. Which one? Which one? The answer. <laughs> The answer is Brit Mila. He waited until he was 99, until Hashem commanded him. Why he didn't keep it before? Other mitzvot he kept before. So why he had to wait until Hashem tell him to circumcise himself? Not only that, he had to go to Aner and Eshkol, and there was the third one. Huh? Mamre. Mamre, Aner and Eshkol. Three goyim. They were important goyim to ask their advice about Rit Mila. Come on, what kind of a joke is this? Avraham, the legendary tzaddik, that the goyim told him, you are the president of God among us. The goyim told him. 
He has to go to three goyim to ask them advice about Brit Mila after Hashem told him to circumcise himself. What's the secret over here? Huh? Why would he need to ask them? Soon we'll see. Remember this. Why Avram did not circumcise himself before? Because this is a mitzvah that you do once in your lifetime. It's not filin every day. It's not brachot every day. Other mitzvot, praying, it's every day. Shabbat is every week. Rosh Chodesh is every month. It's mitzvot. This is a mitzvah once in a lifetime. You cannot do it twice. There is a much bigger reward when you are obligated to do it and when you actually volunteer to do it. When you volunteer to do something you are not obligated, you're going to get a reward, but less than when you become obligated. Why is it? It should have been the other way around. It should have been the other way around. If I have to come to work, I work in a restaurant as a waiter, I have to get there at 3 until 11. I must come every day. I get paid by the hour. If I don't come once or twice, I get fired. So I don't come because I love my boss or I love the job. It's my obligation. I have to do it. And I get paid. If someone doesn't have to come, his uncle owns a restaurant and today there's not enough waiters. And he heard his uncle say to his wife, wow, what are we going to do? We are short. And he said, I'm going to come and wait there from uh, 3 to 11. He doesn't ask for money. He doesn't want anything. He kills himself. And he walks and he cleans. Who does the uncle appreciate a lot more? The waiter that works for him every day or this nephew that came and volunteered and, do it and did it without asking anything in return? Who does the uncle wants to benefit more? The waiter that works every day for years or this volunteer kid? Who? The answer is obvious. Someone who doesn't owe you in rent to do something for you, you have a lot more gratitude to him than someone that you hired to do something for you. Right? But not in the Torah. Why? In life, yes. Of course, someone who volunteer always deserves bigger credit than someone who is obligated. But the Torah is the other way around. Because someone that volunteer has small resistance. Because he's not obligated, he doesn't have yet Sarah. Someone that is obligated, the Satan is holding him, choking him, fighting him, pushing him away. It's an obstacle. Every second of his mitzvah, of, while he's committing the mitzvah, the Satan distracts him nonstop. This one, this problem, that. Why? Because you get a huge reward for that mitzvah, the Satan has everything he can do to prevent you from doing it. When you are not obligated, there's no yetzerah. It's easy. That's why the goyim, I can tell you from experience of many years, they are very generous giving donations until they become Jewish. Why? Because a go is not obligated to give donations. There's no, the Torah didn't say to the goyim, you must support Kiruv, you must support Yeshivot, you must support this and this. Yes, it's, a, it's obvious, it's a decent thing to do. Every goy understands while I'm giving charity, it's going to get a huge reward for it. It's common sense. And the goyim are obligated to do everything that is required by common sense. But the goyim don't have an obligation to run and look where to donate. If they happen to see a poor person with no food, they're going to give him food, obviously. But if they don't see that person, they don't have to run and see, where can I do mitzvot by donating money? If they'll do it, they'll get the reward. But once they become officially Jewish, the Satan fights them ten times harder. Now it became their obligation. They cannot ignore other Jews that are not Shomer Shabbat. It's their obligation to save them. And because they have an obligation, the Satan is going to do everything he can to prevent them from giving a penny. Why? Because it's became their obligation. So everything in life is like this. When you are not obligated, out, you know how many times people came to me and say to me, Rabbi, I'm so upset that I don't have the money. If I had money, I'll give you everything you wanted. You tell me a million dollars, in a second I'll give it to you. 
and I believe him 100%. It's not a crook. Connect him to a lie detector. Ask him, if you make now $5 million in the lottery, would you agree to give 20% donation to the rabbi? Absolutely. The machine shows is actually mean it. No lies. Give him the five million when he wins it next week. And now comes to him and says, what about what you promised? Zero you get. Not even 5,000 you won't get. What happened? He didn't lie. A week ago we checked him by a lie detector. A week ago he had no money to give. It wasn't a practical mitzvah. Hypothetically speaking. His good inclination told him, wow, if you had the money you should have done this and this and that. Now when he finally got the money and it became an obligation to give, now comes the Satan and does everything he can to tighten his heart from preventing him to do the mitzvah. When it becomes practical, comes the Yetzirah. When there's no Yetzirah, you think, oh, if I had the money that this billionaire had, you know how much I would do so much more than him? I would give here and I support them and I will help them and I will help them. How can it be? He's not running to offer help. <laughs> you are 100% right because right now you don't have the test. So you see it with clear eyes because you don't have resistance. He is choked right now. The Satan is occupying every inch of him. This is the secret of life. The more obligated you are, the harder it is to do. The more obligated you are, the harder it is to do. That's why Avram said, if I'm going to do it now, I get a small reward. It's not an obligation. Once it becomes an obligation, comes the Yetzirah. You're 99. What happens if you die? You're going to have pain. How are you going to have guests? All this voice that you hear inside your head, who is talking to you? Every time you want to do something in life, good or bad, you have a conversation in your head. Should I go? Should I wake up now? Should I sleep another half an hour? What will it give me an extra half an hour? Why should I go to the Minyan at 8 o'clock if there is one next door, 7.30? What would I gain? Then comes the other voice. What do you mean? You're going to be refreshed all day. You're not going to yawn, you'll focus, you'll learn better. Well, what is this conversation in your head? Somebody comes to the synagogue, help me out, I'm collecting for poor family. You begin, the debate begins in your mind. How much should I give him? Should I give him five dollars? Ah, it's a shame, five dollars for poor family. Uh, make it fifty. What, fifty? I should go to work, what? I'm going to work, I should give them fifty now. What is this? Five, it's good enough. If everyone will give 50, they'll make a lot of money. I have to support them. <laughs> All this conversation in your head. What is it? Did you ever wonder? Who's speaking? Where are all these voices coming from? These voices are called the Satan. The evil inclination and the angel of death are all one. It's one entity that is divided to three. One is the evil inclination that instigate all the time for you to make sins or to always do less than what you want to do. And it's the Satan who comes and tells about you to Hashem, look at this guy, look at this wicked person, look what he does, look what she does. And that's the executor as well. When the time comes, he gets the note, go and collect the soul of this guy or that one. So we move on. So now they say to Abraham, Abraham is serving them. Abraham, the billionaire, the most important person in the world, is serving three Arabs, idol worshippers that showed up out of nowhere. He's the way there. I want you to go to the house of Bill Gates or the other billionaire, whatever. Walk in and say, listen, and you're all full of dust dirty from the way, sweating, look like homeless basically. You walk into his house, hi, can you make for us something to eat? Of course. Sylvia, como estas? Por favor. Andale, andale. Give them something to eat. Bring them some nachos, some steak, whatever. 
Imagine he comes, he puts his apron, what should I cook for you? How do you like your steak? Well done, medium rare. Would you like french fries? Would you like mashed potato? Should I cut you some Israeli salads? You wouldn't believe what's going on. You, you're Mr. Gay? No, it cannot be. You'll never believe it. Imagine the entire time serving you, collecting, bringing a new... T- 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 what would you like? What you, would you like this? You like that? You wouldn't be able to enjoy the meal. When I went to Panama, I was uh, invited to a very rich person's, to the meal. They have a round table over there. Round table. In the middle of the table, a part of the table is turning around. You push it, and it turns around, like a wheel. It's an unbelievable idea. You don't have to beg, pass me the hummus, pass me the salad, and you wait, well, why, the, why it's all the way there? Everyone roll it, and it goes to all the people around. It comes to you, you take, move it, push it to the next person. Very, very good idea. First time I ever saw it. Problem over there, I couldn't eat. There were six Spanish servants. Panama. Senor, 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 por favor, senor. This, you drink water right away. He takes it, puts no one. <laughs> you, can, you can enjoy the meal. Too much they are trying. Okay, put whatever and go. No. They're afraid of the boss. The patron. They're afraid. So they have to serve you, but it becomes irritating. Now imagine if the owner is serving you. You don't feel comfortable. Imagine you come to the house of Chacham Ovadia Yosef, and he makes you a bagel. Put it in a toaster, take the lax, put it for you, that, serve you the plate. You want to enjoy the meal. Rabbi, I, I feel not comfortable. I'm not, uh, I don't feel comfortable. I remember when Rabbi Adert used to live in Monsi many years ago. We were almost basically neighbors. We lived two blocks away. I used to go to him almost every day, during the day, in the middle of the day. Many times when I came there, there was one homeless man with a lot of bags, with his head like this, with sunglasses. You could never see his eyes. His eyes was always hidden. Almost every time I went there, he came to eat. And Rabbi Adaret, the big rabbi, is serving this homeless, making him food. Shmuel, if I remember his name was Shmuel. Shmuel, what should I make you? Like bagel? You like spaghetti? You like rice? You want this? You want chicken? <laughs> serving him. <laughs> I say to myself, the chutzpah this homeless has. He let the rabbi, on a daily basis, every day, lunch. One time I said to him, Rabbi, what's the pshat here that you keep serving this man? He said, well, how do you know? Maybe it's Eliyahu Anavi coming to test me now like this. Maybe it's Eliyahu Anavi. Could be. The Gemara said, Eliyahu Anavi sometimes come to you and test you. You don't know it's Muslim. If it happened to me once in my life that Eliyahu Anavi came to me, who knows where it was? I told you once the story. If it was him, there is a chance. When was it? Remember the story when I was supposed to fly to London and I'm missing my flight and I'm with two big suitcases and on my way to the airport to JFK, tons of traffic and I cannot make it. And I'm thinking to myself, it's okay, I'm going to park the the car across the street from the terminal, pay, pay five times more parking for a few days. No, whatever. But I'm still not making it. And then the guy from England said, oh, I forgot to tell you. They cancel your flight. What? <laughs> Don't worry, they put you on another flight. For a minute I was so happy. Whoa, what a miracle. Maybe I just got another hour. He said, oh, and, and when is the next flight? Half an hour earlier. <laughs> that was the last bullet to the head. I said, oh, I might as well make a U-turn. That's it. It's not going to be Shabbaton. But I was eating my heart so much because we made four events. I arrived there Mon- uh, 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 Friday morning until Monday. We made four different events. And people actually bothered so much to prepare everything. And all the lefties and the reforms, 
they were fighting not to let me come. You know, they love me so much, these gays and this reform and all this Arurim over there. So they were giving them so much hard time and headache. So I say to myself, after two weeks of so much headache, I will miss the flight? It's the worst disaster ever. So as he told me, it's half an hour earlier, that's it. No chance. No, not even theoretically, no chance to make it to the flight. That's what the flight is any minute, and I'm still in a, on a one week there. I said, listen, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe the plane going to have a problem. Sometimes, you know, they tell you, okay, we're, we're about to board, and this gets stuck there an extra hour. You never know. I said, I'm going to go. Whatever happened, happened. When I arrived, I walked into the terminal with two big suitcases, and I see 50 people waiting online to check in. That's it. It's an hour right there. And my flight leaves in about maybe 30 minutes. So first I have to stand here an hour, and then I have to go through security another 10, 20 minutes. No chance. As I'm standing there thinking, should I leave the suitcases with 4,000 CDs here in a terminal? And they're going to throw them to the garbage. $4,000 to the garbage. And just run to security like this without checking the suitcases. Maybe I'll still make it. Then I'm thinking to myself, but people donated these CDs. How can I throw $4,000 to the garbage? And what's the point of going to England without taking CDs to give out? One lecture makes an impact, but... You give people CDs with 30 hours of lectures on them, that's actually what makes the change. I'm thinking what to do. All of a sudden, a policeman, goy, mustache, little earring. Boom! Rabbi! On my shoulder. So many people running. JFK, I don't have to tell you what's going on over there. Rabbi! I turn around. <laughs> What is this non-Jewish policeman? How does he know me? Now my head is, I don't have now time for people. Rabbi, can I have a selfie or something? You know, everything runs through my mind. What am I doing now? Rabbi, where are you heading to? I say, I'm supposed to go to London, but look what's going on. I have my flight in 20 minutes. It's an hour to wait here. I have to go through security. That's why I'm going to miss my flight. Rabbi, what do you have me for? Like this. What do you have me for? Follow me. Opened this rope. Took me in no line. Comes to this guy. Was an Indian guy. Working for the British Airways. Please uh, print boarding pass. Now I have 50 pounds extra in each suitcase. Imagine I'm hundreds of dollars overweight. I'm ready to pay it. I already took it to consideration. <laughs> the guy did not care about the weight. Right away, it was an emergency. Please see policeman. Print him a boarding pass. Rabbi, I'm waiting for you over there <laughs> by the security. I finish with him in a minute. I have a boarding pass. He took the two suitcases. <laughs> I go over there. He took me like a prime minister. He didn't have to wait online. Security from the side. Five minutes. I was sitting by the, by the gate waiting for the flight. Before he left, I said, let's take a picture. I said, no, you're not allowed. Security cannot take picture of me. But you're very lucky, because tomorrow, today it's my last day over here. Tomorrow they transfer me to Atlanta. <laughs> so I said, okay, let me at least write your name. I wrote his name, some Italian name he had. And I said, I'm going to start my lecture, first lecture, with the story of this miracle. Now I'm thinking to myself, after so many years, where this guy came from, this, this Italian policeman? <laughs> it happened to me in another time when I went to Delta Airline Terminal 7 and I see a policeman smiling to me. While I'm taking my carry-on in a machine, you know, he smiles at me. I think to myself, probably he's going to call me to the side now. He wants to check me out. I say, okay, I'm not in a rush. As I go through the machine, he comes to me and says, so... Where are you heading to today? Oh, you know me? I said, yeah, why am I smiling to you? I said, I don't know, I thought you were a nice guy, what do I know? He said, that's also true. <laughs> said, but how do you know me? Oh, who doesn't know you here? Julia! Oh, I'm Mizrahi here. Sandra, come here. What? How do you know? They watch the debate. 
But that's a different story. Yeah, people watch the debate, you know, but over here, you, this guy showed up on a second that it's either you make it or no. If he wouldn't show up within two or three minutes, that's it, I'll give up. That's it. Why? I have to go back. Baruch Hashem, that trip made a lot of ballet tshuva. There was a lot of noise. But that's sometimes in the one of you, you don't know. Shem sent someone, a messenger, make you a miracle. You only find out when you go to the next world. Remember that policeman? There's no such person. It was a Liyahu Navi. He can come as a goy, he can come as a man, he can come in many different ways. Rabbi Akiva married Rachel. He put her in an igloo made from straw. You know the straw that you give to the horses? Those what they eat. She was a princess living in a mansion with servants, the daughter of the richest guy in Israel, Kalba Savua. She wanted Rabbi Akiva, he was 40 years old, she was a teenager. He was divorced with a kid, complete ignorant, doesn't know how to read and write, completely poor, cleaning horses for her father. Such a story. What girl, religious girl, she has to go on Shiduchim. She wants this kind of guy. She saw he has shame and good manners. She liked him as a human being. She said, I will marry you in one condition. Not to be with you and enjoy. I'm going to turn you into a, a serious Talmid Chacham. You agree to go right away to Yeshiva? If you agree to become Ben Torah and go and learn Torah every day, I'll marry you. Her father cut her out, put her on a bench. She became the poorest woman on earth. And now, when she was there with, alone, alone, imagine, there was no electric. Try to imagine. You live in a beautiful mansion right here in Beverly Hills. Servants. You eat the best food. You have a lot of nice light, oil light, and all these things. You sleep in a great bed. You have a nice lake or pool. I live the life. My father was the richest guy in Israel. All of a sudden, you move to an igloo made from straw. All you see is yellow straw. No electric, in the middle of nowhere, wind, cold, rain. Your husband went away to yeshiva, and there is no WhatsApp video calls. Or any calls, or text, or even mail. When we grew up, there was no WhatsApp, there was no text, there was no cell phones. Most of you are young here, you don't know what I'm talking about. I was born into a world with, uh, with social media, with phones. When I was a kid, there was no cell phone, no internet, no laptops, no nothing basically. And only one out of a hundred families in Israel had a rotary phone. It takes a minute to dial a number. A minute, 60 seconds. You go like this from the nine all the way and leave. And it goes back. And many times you don't do it. Your hands comes out. You don't, you don't have enough strength. So you have to hang up and try again. Sometimes it will take two minutes just to make a funk. Rolling him like this. That's how, and, and most people didn't have phones. You had to go to the neighbor, give them a few shekel, wait online, because all the neighbor would come. Who had phones? People that their, ch their children died in a war. So the government gave them priority because they didn't have enough lines. <laughs> there was no television. When I was a kid, there was no television. Only then they bought the first TV and it was black and white. And they had one show a week. One show a week. It was not, it was not working 24-7, 500 channels, none of these things. It wasn't. Oh, it's already 10.20. Oh. Tov, we will have to finish. So, so, so Rachel is alone, and Hashem sent to her Eliyahu Anavi as a poor person, say, can you lend me some straw? You have so much straw, can you give me some of it? Why did Hashem do it? To make you feel good. As poor as you are, there are people that are actually suffering more than you. 
From here you learn that other people's misery is a comfort to you. Even though it's stupid to think like this, but it's reality. Because like they say in America, misery like company. Right? If you're the only one who didn't get accepted, it kills you. But if all your friends didn't get accepted, I can live with that. How does it change your future? It doesn't. Why does it help you that other people are poor? It doesn't. But it makes you feel not as bad. Why? I'm not the only one. He suffers. She suffers. Everyone here suffers. We're all getting bummed. So, you know, I can live with that. In Israel, we used to say, Tzarat Rabim Chatsi Nechama. And the teacher used to answer, Tzarat Rabim Nechama Tipshim. Tzarat Rabim, trouble of others, of many people, it's half a comfort. It's not a full comfort, but it's 50% comfort. And the teacher used to say, Mizrahi, no. It's a comfort to the full. It's very logical. Why would it comfort you that other people fail? So now you're not the only moron. There's another five in the class. How does it change your life? The answer is, believe it or not, you can give me all the logical reasons, and you're right, it's not going to help me in any way, but it makes you feel not as bad. Can you deny it? If you deny it, my answer to you will be from the Gemara. Hashem doesn't agree with you. Why did he send Rachel, Eliyahu Navi, like a poor person to beg for straw? How is it supposed to comfort her that she is so poor and as one person that even straw he doesn't help? Okay, but it doesn't help me. I'm still miserable and alone here and poor. Once you see someone else suffer more than you, your suffering is not as hard. Meaning you have a gratitude to Hashem. Thank you that I'm not like this. Once you already have the gratitude, thank you, it's not only me, thank you, I'm not like this, thank you that I'm not the worst, it could, be, could have been worse, you already get spiritual energy to fight your problem or to have more hope for the future. Hope for the future. I would like to finish, t tomorrow in Brooklyn I will finish the rest, but I would like to finish now. And uh, the angels are about to tell Avraham that he's going to have his own child. Remember, he's 99 years old, and his wife is 10 years younger than him. When they will have the baby, she will be 90 and he will be 100. How many years then been married? How many years? Who knows? How many? 74 years. 74 years. When she gave birth, it was 75 years. Abraham got married 25 and she was 15. And she didn't have a wound. It's not like some women have all kinds of symptoms, this, that, hormones, a cyst, I don't know. They can get pregnant. But there is always a chance, especially today with technology. Imagine a woman comes to the doctor, they make an MRI and they say she doesn't have a wound. She was born without any incubator. She cannot have a baby. You need a, a huge miracle to have a baby. So she, he, they already married 75 years. How can you be married 75 years with the same person? Believe it or not, it's possible. Here you go. And not only that, they were still young. He was still handsome and she was the most pretty woman in the whole world. Remember, there was no, there was no old age yet. Nobody got sick. Nobody got old. You look like you're 20. Avram and Yitzchak look exactly the same. Nobody knows who's, Av who's the father, who's the son. Avram asked Hashem to make the fathers look different than the kids. And that's when Hashem brought aging to the world. Yaakov asked Hashem that people will be sick before they die. They will have a grace period of time to prepare for the dead that they can repent. If you die instantly, you cannot repent. Boom, you get a bullet to the head. That's it, you're finished. You fall from a building, you can't repent. You had an accident, you can't repent. You die slowly, you're old, you have two months, three months left, you feel it. You have time to prepare. 
you ask for forgiveness, you return stolen goods, you do things, you learn more Torah, you ask forgiveness from people you offended. Time to prepare. We look at it as a bad thing. How much people invest to try to prevent getting old? Plastic surgeries and this and that and all and uh, vitamins and who knows what. And exercise and stay young forever. One of the most depressing things, especially for women, is when they begin to lose their beauty as they get older and older. That's why the Israeli crooks in all the malls make millions over that. Selling the Dead Sea Cosmetic Wonder products. Oh man, I have this special glue. You put it on your wrinkle like this, look. Look at you, you look 20 years younger. It's going to last? Of course. It's going to last until you get into the car in a parking lot. That's the scams. Why? He just sold her a dream. Pay paying $100 for this cream and look 20 years younger. What woman wouldn't buy this dream? Reality. By the way, do you know that today you have more cosmetic plastic surgeries than ever before? Who knows why? Selfie. The selfie, the, the, the doctor, the plastic surgeon, they have to send the phone companies a very serious bonus and dividend. They have 10 times more work thanks to the selfie. Because the selfie twists the face. Make you look fatter and crooked and this and your neck is double on the sides and your nose is double on the side. For, no, no, it's officially what I told you now, it's scientific proof. From the minute, no doctor will deny it, from the minute they invented selfie that you can look at yourself on your phone and it twists your entire real image, mentally people will go crazy. Wow, I didn't know I'm so ugly. I didn't know I'm so fat. I didn't know my nose is so big. I didn't know my teeth are so crooked. I didn't know I have so many wrinkles. It makes everything, you know, right away. Plastic surgery. No, no. I actually read an article about it. The number one reason why... Uh, there's another reason. People are more artificial today. They're less spiritual. The less spiritual you are, the more you care about the outside. The more spiritual you are, the more you care about the inside. I give you an example. When you were a kid in school, who looked always the sloppiest out of everyone? The professors, the teachers with the hair like these, big old glasses, you know, the shirt is, the buttons are wrong. One button is here, the one over there is like this. One shoe is brown, one shoe is black. I had teachers like this. But they were not religious. They were all communist reshaim. But they were very sloppy. Why? Because they learned all their life. Shtuyot. But they were learning. Science, math. Since they were busy learning, they didn't care how they look. Later on, when I moved to high school, and you know, that's when people became more and more artificial. And then, and then they obviously cared about how they look. And today, that's all they care about. That's the number one thing in a person's life, especially the secular. So now, the angels come and say, in one year from today, your wife, Sarah, will have a boy. And she listens, and, and she laughs. <laughs> yeah, right. What do you want? Nine years old, what do you expect? She's 89. She doesn't have a wound. She doesn't know it. But she already saw that she, they couldn't have kids all these years. 74 years, no kids. 74 years. Avram and Sarah are old. Sarah doesn't have period. Already a long, long time ago. She's laughing in her heart. After I became old, meaning dying out, now I'm going to have pleasant surprise like this. And my master, meaning my husband, is old. 
And Hashem comes to Abraham and says, why Sarah is laughing? Why does she say that she's old? She says, Abraham is old. Why HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't say to Abraham, why Sarah said that you're old? To the best of my knowledge, when a couple cannot have kids because of old age, usually it's the problem by the girl. She can have kids up to 40, 45, I don't know, 50, even though today I heard that one Indian woman gave birth age 70. Seven years old gave birth. Don't ask me how. It's very interesting. In a parasha that we talk about Sarah, that she's 90 years old, gave birth. A woman in India, today I saw the picture. Very skinny Indian woman, gave birth, seven years old. There's always uh, extraordinary miracles that happens. But she's laughing. I'm going to have kids. It's remember, she doesn't know there are angels. It's three, it's three Arabs. Three Arabs are coming and saying, next year your wife will have, a, will, have a, will have a child. Why not to laugh? What is the crime to laugh? And she said that her, her, her husband is old. If she say, I'm old, I cannot have kids, I understand. What, what is the connection now in the Adonis Aken? Meaning he's not unable to already have intimacy. That's what it means. He can't even, he can't even be with me. Who knows, maybe there are a few years already not together. So what is going on? But I don't understand one thing. Didn't we just say that there was no old people? Huh? Didn't we just say that everybody looked the same? Whether you're 70, whether you're 20? The answer, look the same, but don't feel the same. You get old. Of course, you're 70, you're not 20. You get old. You feel like a 70 years old. Mentally, physically, you cannot climb the stairs, you cannot run as you used to, you cannot breathe as easy as you used to, but you look young. No gray hair, no wrinkles, nothing. You look like a father, no difference. You and him look alike. You understand, Rabotai? So now she said, so now she said that she's, uh, you know, she's, uh, she's old and her, and her husband is old. And Hashem comes to Abraham and say, we almost finished two minutes. And uh, she said that uh, I cannot have kids. She's laughing and Hashem comes to Abraham to complain. Why she's laughing? But he doesn't tell Abraham that she said that you are old. It's a big sin to instigate between husband and wife. If, one, if a wife comes to you and complains about her husband, and then the husband comes and says, well, what did she say about me? You're not allowed to say, oh, my husband is so boring. He's so tired all the time. He's always on his phone. He's so stingy. Every day, check my credit card bill. I can't have it anymore. He never helped me. I can have, I can, it doesn't help me with the kids. What did she say about you? That you're so generous. Such a great husband. He's such a hard-working guy. She loves you so much. That's what she said? Yes. All lies. You did a mitzvah or a sin? You committed a sin or no? Mitzvah. I want to ask you a question. Did Hashem actually lie? Or he twisted the story a little bit? I don't see where Hashem actually lied here. He didn't lie. She said, So she actually said, I'm old now. How can I have this pleasant surprise now? So she, didn't, she actually said that she's old. She also said that Abraham is old. And Hashem only told him half of the story. He didn't lie. He said, why is she saying that she's old? Why would Hashem also say that she also say you are old? To cause... A grief between them? Even people understand that it's not a good thing to do. Why you generate information? Hashem said half of the story. She said that she's old. She also said you're old, but I don't want to say this. These angels, when Hashem said, and to, and said that Sarah was laughing, she denied it. 
ותכחש שרה לאמור, לא צחקתי, I didn't lie. כי יראה, she was afraid to admit that she laughed. And Hashem said to her, no, you did laugh. They're now going to destroy the Sodom and Gomorrah people. That's a beautiful lecture waiting for tomorrow night. I wanted to do it tonight, but time is flying. But I will finish with a question. It sounds like a little girl from school. You know, this, you have a little girl. She's five years old. Sarale! Sarale! Why did you say that you didn't take the candy? I didn't say. No, yes, you did. No, I didn't. What is this? That's what the Torah has to tell us now. What do you learn? You know, remember, every word in the Torah, it's a school for life. Not just a lecture. School for entire life. What, well, let's see who's clever here. What do you learn from this verse? What do you learn? Now, in every day of your life, from now on. Why people lie? One of the reasons is because they are embarrassed. The shame. It's such a pain that people are willing to do everything to prevent the shame. If they can prevent it with a quick lie and it worked and nobody knows it was you, wonderful. I just saved the shame. If they cannot lie, meaning there was a camera or witnesses, they will give any amount of money to prevent them one minute shame. Anything. They come to the witnesses. Listen, I give each one of you a thousand dollars. Please don't say it was me. No, no, what a thousand dollars. Forget you want us to get into trouble? Okay, I give you five thousand each. Why is he so generous all of a sudden? He's usually stingy. He's willing to give his life not to get the shame. When Sarah realized she made a mistake. Well, Hashem can do everything he wants. Why did I really laugh? It's a lack of emuna. Why did you laugh? No, I didn't laugh. It's a big shame. I'm blessing you that you're going to have a child and you're laughing? You're questioning me? You're questioning the master of universe who actually sent you messengers to inform you that you're about to have a kid and you're wondering? Meaning, it's similar to those from the university. Everything they have to explain with human logic. Scientifically, Rabbi. Prove it scientifically. If not, I don't follow anything. That's why I make Torah and Science, Life After Death, all these scientific films. Purpose of Life. What for? For those uh, academic, the thing, everything has to be proven scientifically in order for me to make changes in my life. A real kosher person does not need any proof. Once I know Hashem gave us the Torah in a public event in front of millions of witnesses, and from then on he moved from father to son all over the world. Everybody gets it from the one before and one before. That's it. That's the best proof. I don't need now to go and examine it based on the scientific proof and what the discovery and all that and the doctors and the scientists. This is for low-level people. They think they are great. Doctors, professors. They are the lowest level people. A little Moroccan or Bukharian woman sitting in a market cleaning parsley and cooking ashpolo and every second think about Hashem and knows everything is from Him and live with simple faith. She's a million times better than this academic scientist, Nobel Prize winner. He cannot be 1% of the simple, ordinary people with emuna. Yes, even Goim. Some Goim have strong emuna in Hashem. 100%. I'll never forget, we went to buy one time something from an Arab. And uh, all together in Shkalim was $500. You have to pay him two weeks before you actually deliver. So the guy said to him, you're going to deliver the goods? I wasn't worried. Because he called Amex and cancel it. <laughs> but the Israeli guy that was with me, he doesn't know what credit card is, doesn't even have a smartphone. So he was worried. 
So he said to the Arab, you're going to actually deliver the good? He gave him such a look. What do you think, I'm a thief? Don't you think I'm afraid from Allah? I'm going to steal? You're out of your mind? What do you think, I need, in order for me to make money, I have to be a thief? To be a killer, no problem. <laughs> but to be a thief? A second later, he started to pray over there on the floor. So I said to the guy, if you ask me, who should I lay money up front? To this Arab Hamasnik, radical Muslim, or to Itzik, the Israeli professor from the university, the gay. I have to give him 500 and I have to give him 500 and hope they'll deliver the good. Who do you think I would sleep better at night knowing the money is in his hand? Sad. Because this Arab, even though he follow Quran and Quran is not from God and Muhammad is not a prophet, but in his mind it is. And in his mind he's afraid of God because he knows you should not steal. One thing I don't understand is, next to it it says you should not kill. Why this part, I don't know, maybe didn't come to the class. They skip a class, I don't know. Why they support terror, why they support murder. That's another lecture. Bezrat Hashem will see you tomorrow in Brooklyn, 8 p.m. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen v'amen. Rabbi Hananiah ben Akashia Omer, Atzai, Kedosh Baruch Hu, Lezakot, Et Yisrael.